morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Fast Pitch session. My name is Joe Manser. I'm an RPE fellow, and I will be moderating the Q&A in today's session. And just as a reminder, um, please text your questions to 22333. Uh, start your message with that number you see, see there, 381971, uh, I believe. And remember that the questions need to be 160 characters or less. Otherwise, they'll be truncated, and we won't receive them. Um, so before we uh, jump into the slides and the, and the pitches themselves, I want to provide a brief introduction to this session. This is not uh, what we typically do, but there's a common theme that you'll see in the first four talks um, that you know it's, it makes sense to present these up front. And the, the theme you'll see uh, is that wind and solar have crossed a tipping point in terms of generation costs. And these resources are now hands down the cheapest forms of new build power generation on the grid today. With median bids for wind and solar coming in around four and a half cents per kilowatt hour, and in, in some of the better regions, even three cents per kilowatt hour on an unsubsidized basis. And having cheap electricity from these resources is great and fantastic, but it's not enough if we're going to realize their full potential. We need new forms of flexibility and system operation if we're going to, to realize the full potential of these resources. And the potential is, is vast, particularly in the United States. We are fortunate to have vast solar and wind resources here. Um, and much in the same way that hydraulic fracturing uh, opened up our abundant natural gas reserves, uh, cheap solar and wind generation can open up the vast reserves of renewable capacity in the United States. Um, and, and by increasing this capacity, we can, for example, maintain low natural gas costs, which can be useful for other industries, say the chemical industry, um, as well as open up uh, natural gas exporting opportunities. So it's really an economic advantage for the United States. So here's a, a visual outline of what you'll see uh, today. And this is RPE, so we put everything in a graph. Um, and what we're looking at is what kinds of penetrations uh, of wind and solar can we expect, or, or how can we achieve high penetrations of these resources on the grid? So in the first talk, we'll be looking at nearer term opportunities, uh, things like new forms of resource management, flexible inverters, and other uh, means of flexibility in the system that on a regional basis can you know, ideally or hopefully achieve penetrations in the 50 to 60% range on an annual energy basis. In the second and third talks, we'll be looking at new forms of long duration energy storage for balancing and load shifting of renewables, uh, renewable resources. Um, in the multi-day time scale, which becomes important as we go to even higher penetrations. And then in the fourth talk, we'll see um, geologic storage and sort of a, a further uh, term look at, you know, how do we do seasonal shifting of wind and solar generation. Um, and of course, no, no uh, summit would be complete without a little bit of blockchain. And so Jenny will follow up with and finish with blockchain, sort of the black sheep of this session but I think it'll be a fun talk and, and you guys will really enjoy it. Um, so with that, I uh, would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Corey Hedman, the Program Director at RPE. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for being here today. I'm gonna talk about how we can ask more from wind and solar power. Okay. In the electric power sector, energy is the dominant component that we rely upon and we've put our focus towards. Uh, relative to our electric energy production today, renewable resources make up roughly 15% of our electric energy production. But about half of that as of now comes from hydropower and not wind and solar. And then across the US, we have various different renewable portfolio standards. Some, words, some have goals upwards of 50%. But energy alone is not the only resource uh, product that we rely upon. We also rely upon ancillary services. Our ancillary services are our balancing services. It's the ability for a, uh, a unit to provide flexibility. And that is how we make sure that the lights stay on. This is a very important issue. If you recall from the 2003 blackout, we had roughly a cost of $10 billion due to that blackout. Uh, while they are very important, wind and solar resources really do not provide much ancillary services as of yet today. 
Uh, and also an imp important note is we really don't have any goals associated to what these uh, wind and solar resources should be able to provide regarding the ancillary services. And it's not only about whether or not they have the capability themselves to provide this ancillary service, but how we treat them, manage them, and utilize them within the grid. And that's what I'm talking about today. But where does this challenge come from? Uh, intermittent resources are our wind and solar resources, and they come with two predominant challenges. Uh, the first one I would say is renewable variability. This is a famous duck chart from California that shows their predicted and already realized uh, issues that they have with their solar penetration levels. You can see a 13,000 megawatt ramp event that they uh, already have to face often at the evening hours. That's the size of roughly 13 nuclear power plants. But variability by itself is, is uh, similar to driving your car and facing an uphill a climb, having to overcome a steep hill. As long as your engine is capable of doing so, you should be fine. There is also another problem that comes with renewables, and that is uncertainty. This is a chart that you can uh, get from an actual wind farm location in California in terms of their production over a 30-day period. Uncertainty is a quite a different beast. Uh, this is, instead of facing a steep hill that you know is coming, it's the bad driver in front of you slamming on the brakes unexpectedly. Uh, it's a completely different issue that we have to handle in the grid. And when you take your conventional resources and then you displace them with stochastic resources, these intermittent resources, you get these two challenges. It really, what it does is it causes you to go back to your remaining resources that have this flexibility and you must acquire more ancillary services from them. It's uh, somewhat like having to slam on the gas and hit the brakes continuously to balance out these intermittency issues. It is a challenge, and that challenge is going to con continue to grow as you get more and more renewables on your grid. This is also not something that's simply handled by geographical diversity because the resources are dispersed across the, the system and we have a transmission grid that must transport it from A to B. Just as you have traffic in your roads, uh, you have congestion in our transmission system. So geographical diversity by itself doesn't just smooth this out. This is the challenge that we are facing already and it's growing in terms of its importance. So coming back to this slide, renewable resources have reached a tipping point in terms of cost competitiveness for energy, but there are still challenges that we must have to overcome associated to these balancing services that we must ha uh, have to make sure that the grid stays operational. Uh, and that's really the focus point of this discussion. If you want to push your system to high levels of renewables, some people have uh, pushed on towards 80%, as you increase more and more renewables, you will have to go out and procure more and more ancillary services. What is happening then is you are reducing the fleet that can provide these ancillary services, but also increasing the amount of ancillary services that are needed. Of course, we are uh, aware of this issue and trying to innovate in that space. One issue that we are is what the other two talks will talk, uh, focus on, long duration energy storage. Uh, so storage is one solution to this problem. We are also focusing on flexible load programs, but it's very hard to overcome this challenge on these two innovation areas alone. And really what it does is it keeps us reliant on the conventional generator as a means of providing this flexibility. This is where we need to go to make a change. We need to go back to the source of the problem, which is at the renewable resource itself, how we treat that resource and how we utilize that resource. Why is this important? So coming back to one of my earlier slides, even though ancillary services are not the most dominant component in the electric power sector today, as you then switch to renewable resources, the importance of those ancillary services will grow, and you're gonna find that they're gonna be much more important in the future. It'll be the companies that can innovate in the realm of flexibility for their renewable resources that will lead the pack, and this is very important. Now, RPE, as well as other government agencies, are trying to tackle this problem from many different fronts. This is just one example of an ongoing RPE program called the Nodes Program that's trying to leverage distributed energy resources to provide these ancillary services. But as I said before, we need to also go to the heart of the problem, which is at the renewable resource itself, how we treat those and how we manage those resources. Again, renewable resources are then seen as this intermittent, not controllable resource that threatens our stability and our reliability of our system that can 
uh, threaten the, the ability to keep the lights on. But that's not necessarily how they should be treated. We should change that. How we need to change that is acknowledge them for the flexibility that they do have and the dispatch ability that they, that they can provide so that they can then, instead of uh, hurt, hurting the stability and the reliability of the system, we transition them to a role that they are providing ancillary services just as other conventional generators are required to do so today. It's actually may not be known, but renewable resources for the most part have been exempt from providing these ancillary services until a recent passing by FERC. Where does this problem reside? Well, what I would put the attention to for this talk is in our management systems. To operate the grid is not a simple task, but the issue with the management systems is that the fundamental controllable resource that we have relied upon for ages is the conventional generator, something that's firm and controllable and that we can rely upon. And as such, our, our management systems have a very much deterministic nature to them. That is where the change needs to come. We need to enable these management systems and decision support tools to acknowledge the uncertainty of these renewable resources that we are integrating into our system. Uh, in summary, the areas for innovation start with acknowledging that the future of electric power systems will be focused much more on flexibility and the quality of service that our resources can provide. And then with that, it's not just at the resource itself, but in the control room environment and our management systems that we need to innovate to acknowledge the stochastic nature of these resources, but also enable them to provide the flexibility we need to keep the lights on. Uh, the finance sector is famous for its uh, risk management and use of stochastic optimization, and the reason is because they have to deal with a lot of stochastic issues. The electric power system is moving this exact same direction with the reliance on wind and solar. We need to move in the direction of then enabling those resources to provide those uh, re uh, ancillary services back to the grid. Uh, finally, I would point at market issues. Often markets are considered to not be an area for technical innovation, but some of the best advancements that we have initiated have come from innovations in market design. It is very important that we acknowledge their capability and their flexibility, as well as send them back the appropriate pricing structures that encourage that, that behavior. And with that, I would, would uh, finish with a quote, a modified quote, if you price it, they will come. So thank you very much. Uh, with that, I will conclude and pass it on to Paul. Thank you, Corey, and good morning. My name is Paul Albertus. I'm also a program director at RBE. The title of my fast pitch today is Beyond the Hour and the Day, Cost-Effective Long-Duration Energy Storage. Just to remind you where we are in the sequence that Joe showed at the beginning of um, this session, um, Corey just spoke in the first talk about uh, new forms of resource management and handling and, and dealing with um, the, the variability of, of renewable sources like wind and solar. Um, Joe and I, in, in talks two and three, will then speak about new approaches for energy storage that would have durations at rated power of roughly 10 to 100 hours. So this is cycling beyond just the diurnal, the typical diurnal cycle that people think about. So if you want to find an example of a long duration storage system in the United States today, you'd want to go out and look for a pump storage facility. This is one example of a pump storage facility located in Massachusetts, it's called Bear Swamp. It stores about 3.6 gigawatt hours of electrical energy um, in the form of, of, of gravity potential energy. And um, these kinds of assets provide many important grid so services. Um, they help to reduce wholesale energy prices, they help to improve overall system uh, efficiency, they also can provide capacity services. Unfortunately, um, and, and these, systems, these um, resources also have very favorable capital costs and round-trip efficiency. So in many ways, this is an ideal um, storage technology. Unfortunately, the deployment of these systems has essentially stopped. If you look at the history of the deployment of, of pump storage systems in the United States, you can see that during the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there was a lot of, um, a lot of installations, uh, totaling around uh, 22 gigawatts and over 200 gigawatt hours. But in the last generation, 25 years or so, there's been essentially no new facilities that, that have been built. Um, just recently, there's been a little bit of growth of battery storage, and people expect that to continue. Batteries are a technology that could offer a similar kind of services as what pump storage has provided um, historically and does provide, continue to provide today. So as we, as we think about um, the future into which we would put uh, storage um, devices, 
we know that the grid of the past 50 years is going to be different than what we build in the next 50 years. But one constant throughout is that we're going to want to be able to provide low-cost electricity for a very large fraction of the year. That's going to be a constant uh, no matter how the grid evolves. And so if you just look at a baseline here, this is showing the wholesale electricity price in Texas in the year 2016 over the hours of the year. This is called a price duration curve. Um, this is what it looked like for Texas in 2016. And so you can see that over 95, roughly 95% of the hours of the year were produced at under five cents per kilowatt hour, with the remainder roughly 5% or so being um, produced at a higher cost in the form of peaker plants or things like that. And so this is a, a reasonable baseline for us to use. And so the, and the problem to be solved or the question that we want to ask is, um, are we able to build a future wind and solar plus storage generation system that would have a cost profile like the one that we have today, where 90, over 90% 90 of the hours are produced at under five cents per kilowatt hour? The answer, of course, all of us at RP are optimists. Um, the answer is yes, but we need to have new kinds of technical approaches and technologies that we don't have today to do this. Uh, in particular, we need two things. Number one is storage with uh, storage systems with tens of hours of duration. And number two is we need to have storage systems that in particular have very low energy costs. And I'd like to go through each one of these uh, sequentially in the, in the remainder of my pitch. So first off, storage systems with tens of hours of duration. There's now been um, some sophisticated modeling of the kinds of durations you need for different amounts of wind and solar on, on, on different kinds of systems, ranging from individual installations of a single wind or, so or solar farm all the way up to a very large grid like the Texas Grid or Cal ISO or PJM. Um, I'm not going to go through that fairly sophisticated modeling, but I'd like to give you a very simple and visual um, explanation for why it's important to have longer duration storage. So here's um, an example of uh, wind output in Texas in, in the year 2016 as well. Um, and I'm going to show you different um, time increments for this. And so you can see here, if you, if you divide this into one hour time increments, you can see that the output ranges from essentially zero gigawatts all the way up to about 16 gigawatts. And so if we then step through, this is showing eight hour time increments. You can still see a lot of variability. And this kind of echoes what Corey was showing earlier as well. Um, here is. Um, 24 hour time blocks, uh, this is uh, 72 hour time blocks, and this is 168. And so you can see um, as you go toward longer time increments, you start to even this out. And in particular, if you just very simply draw kind of a, a min and max on, on top of this, and then walk back through that sequence of different amounts of, of time averaging, you can see that in particular, as you go from this roughly eight hour up towards 72 hours, or let's say 10 to 100 hours, you get a lot of smoothing that can take place. This is a very simple visual explanation for why you'd want to have storage systems that have durations of 10 to 100 hours. Okay, so that's the first point. Number two is, what does that mean for the types, if we, if we want to build those kinds of systems, what, what attributes would they need to have? And in particular, um, it's important to understand that they need to have very low energy costs. And so uh, it's important to see here that uh, we, for these systems, we can divide this into both an energy component and a power component. And so the energy component would have units of, say, watt hours or joules, and the power component then would have um, units of, of watts. And so we need to keep this in mind as, as we think through the cost structure. So as you think about this cost structure, here I'm showing you the, uh, the complete system cost um, expressed as dollars per kilowatt hour. That includes both the energy component and the power component as a function of duration. And basically all the commercial activity that we see today is shown in the upper left-hand corner of this figure. Um, typically a few hour duration and um, more than 90% of it today is with the ion um, systems. Um, this is the, shows the, uh, the complete system cost as a function, function of duration for with the ion. And you can see that it basically has a cost floor fully installed of roughly $200 per kilowatt hour. Um, so when you translate this to how that would turn into a, a price duration curve, you can see that that kind of basic cost structure simply will not work. Um, in particular, if our goal is still five cents per kilowatt hour and um, the wind or solar cost alone is say two and a half cents per kilowatt hour, which would represent a future 2030 um, value for wind or solar in a good location, um, and, and then plot on in a semi-quantitative way how this would work with, with the mine cost structure, you can see that there's no way to accomplish 90% 90, 90 of the hours of the year at under five cents per kilowatt hour uh, of cost. Um, if you then contrast that to what you'd see with pump storage, you can see here that at short durations of say six or eight hours that those costs look fairly similar, but as you go toward longer durations, it's a fundamentally different. And in particular, because the energy cost of pump storage is so much lower, that gives you a very different scaling with duration. And so if you then look at this for how this would 
look in a kind of semi-quantitative way for pump storage, it looked very different. So here we have a lot of hours of the year um, that we can still, over 90%, let's say, that we can still produce at under five cents per kilowatt hour. And so what we really need then is to think about a new kind of opportunity, a new kind of technical challenge for doing this, and I've outlined that here. And just to break that up then into uh, a separate power cost and an energy cost, um, so, here, so here I'm showing the installed power cost on the Y and the installed energy cost on the X, um, and this is shown for a fixed levelized cost of storage of five cents per kilowatt hour. Pretty much where a lot of people are working today, a lot of what RPE sees is the 10 hour problem statement. There's a lot of R&D focus on this right now, the diurnal time shift. And that's very important um, duration to work on. We also think that there's uh, a potential for a new kind of problem statement focused on durations that are longer, say 10 to 100 hours, and in particular, as you go over toward uh, the left-hand side of this figure, you can see that the required energy cost becomes something like, installed energy cost, something like $20 per kilowatt hour. And so that's a very different kind of um, cost structure than what we deal with for storage today. And so with that, I, I imagine all of you are wondering, um, what are some technical ideas for how you could build um, long-duration storage systems? And for that difficult and important question, I'll turn this over to my colleague, Joe Manser. Just as a reminder, uh, please text your questions in to the number up on the screen and make sure you're keeping them under 160 characters. So as uh, Paul mentioned, now that we've looked at this top-down uh, economic picture of what is required for long-duration energy storage in a cost-effective way, we're now gonna take a bottom-up approach and look at some of the cost and technical requirements for components and subsystems within these storage assets that's necessary to achieve a fixed cost of five cents per kilowatt hour per cycle, which is an important thing to keep in mind. And so as we think about decoupling energy and power in these storage systems, we can look even more granular at the type of things that go into a complete storage system. And the importance here, the important thing I wanna point out is that we need to take a holistic system design perspective when we're trying to cost optimize these uh, storage systems, and in particular, the, the energy portion is, is the key here, as, as Paul mentioned in his talk, you know, costs on the order of 20 to $30 per kilowatt hour for the energy portion of the storage system uh, itself. And so this is made up of, you know, of course, the raw storage materials, you know, the processing required of those materials, and then even the tanks themselves become important considerations as we scale to long duration. So I'm gonna touch on, on these different points. So for the energy storage materials themselves, um, there's a number of important uh, scientific and engineering trade-offs we need to weigh very carefully when we're designing these systems. And so I'm gonna talk about a couple of those. And the first one I wanna talk about is looking at the energy density of the storage material itself on a per uh, mass basis, that's on the y-axis here, and cost in dollars per kilogram. And so what you're seeing in these lines are, are lines of fixed cost per unit energy. And uh, for long duration applications, again, very low energy costs are required. Um, and so as we scale out you know, into the 50, 100 hour durations, we're looking at you know, the cost of the material itself. This does not include conversion losses, but just for the raw material and, and how you're storing that energy on the order of five and, and even in some cases less than $1 per kilowatt hour as you go to very long duration. And so when we, when we think about um, you know, types of materials and types of technologies that can achieve this, they're, they're really across a number of different storage classes from sensible thermal materials, you know, latent thermal phase change materials, um, chemical and mechanical uh, methods. And if you look at, you know, what's shown up here in green, which is really where we wanna focus, um, and you'll notice things like rocks and water and air and sodium and sulfur and hydrogen and ammonia. So things that are very, very low cost, highly abundant. And those are what we wanna focus on when we're thinking about designing um, these next generation or these new long duration storage systems. And of course, cheap materials is, is not enough, right? That's not sufficient. Again, we need to take a, a holistic picture, a holistic perspective on the storage system and in, in even the containers themselves, right? So what are we putting these materials in? Um, and so this plot here on the left is showing the cost of the container itself um, as a function of the energy density of the, the media it contains. Right? So these things are inversely proportional, and I wanna make an important point here that energy density is, is emphasized in transportation and mobile applications and not so much in stationary applications. But energy density is an absolutely key parameter for long duration storage because it affects the amount of material you need to, to store a given amount of energy as well as the size of your container. So these are very important cost considerations for long duration storage. 
And I've shown on here just a couple of different you know, tank materials from shipping containers all the way up to high temperature calcium aluminate takes. Um, and so we'll see how that impacts our costs uh, here in this right plot. So what I'm showing here is the cost of the container, which is in orange, and the cost of the, the storage material in blue. And this is just for a, an example, you know, sensible thermal storage material where if we increase the temperature of that material, we increase energy density because it's important, it's proportional to the change in temperature. And so what that means is for a given amount of energy, we need less material and therefore it's less expensive. And that's great. However, as we push to higher temperature, our, the material requirements for our tanks themselves become more stringent. We can no longer use cheap carbon steel. We now need to go to stainless steel that which, which has a creep limit, say above 600 degrees Celsius. And as we push to even higher temperatures, things like calcium aluminate and other high temperature uh, containers may be required. And the choice of the container is, is gonna be a function of the temperature and the, the chemical properties of the media, as well as pressure and other factors. And so the thing to point out here is that the optimal design point is not necessarily the point that minimizes the energy storage media cost, but rather the point that minimizes both the media and its container. Um, in this case, uh, avoiding going to that expensive calcium aluminate tank. And so for long duration storage, you know, the areas we're really interested in are, are container costs that are well below $10 per kilowatt hour. And what that means in reality is that if you've got a new flow battery chemistry that's 10 watt hours per liter, um, and you're putting it in a polypropylene tank, that's not gonna cut it. Right, so, so energy density is key and the type of storage uh, tanks and materials you're using are, are very important for these applications. So as we think about you know, cheap materials, cheap tanks, um, I also wanna bring up the point and, and the challenge is how can we change the way we scale these systems in terms of their energy capacity? So the way we do it today is you have a, you have a power block and you have an energy storage unit and you simply just add more of these. Right? It's not, not, nothing special, you just add more tanks uh, but the challenge we want to put out is, are there better ways to optimize for long duration storage applications and the unique operational profile that exists for these assets? And in particular, you know, one example would be, you know, we're, we're utilizing these longer hours less often. So are there ways to say design a system where you have a tank for daily cycling um, that has a particular cycle life, say over, you know, over a 20 year period, um, but as you move into the longer durations of this system, you have materials that maybe are lower cost but have lower cycle life. So you sacrifice performance in the interest of cost. And you know, the challenge here, of course, would be having a power block that can manage these different storage materials. So that's, that's one particular area of interest, as well as designing materials for a particular use profile or, or a typical cycle life uh, that we would expect for long duration storage. Another example of a way to change the scaling of, of energy systems is to you know, utilize different energy densities within the same system. So for example, if you have a flow battery uh, chemistry that's 15 watt hours per liter in your daily cycling, and that, the reason is you need a certain uh, molarity or concentration that your power block can, can handle. The tanks you use, for, you use less often in your long duration application, maybe we can have those at higher energy density to, uh, to minimize the, the containerization costs themselves. And so this obviously would be through some kind of separation process and then a rapid mixing before it goes back into the power block. So these are just a couple ideas that we've, that we've brainstormed. I'll touch briefly on the power block. I'm not gonna spend too much time here because we know the energy costs are the most important thing to focus on. Um, but we're looking for things that are less than a dollar per watt. Um, and what's important here is that there are of course multiple technologies that, that, can, that can play in this space. <clears throat> and um, we're sort of on the flip side of the coin now relative to energy. And so whereas energy we're trying to, as we go to longer durations, really minimize cost. The power cost, we can actually, we can actually um, look at technologies that have higher power costs because they represent a lower fraction of the total overall system capital cost. And so things like solid oxide fuel cells, certain types of flow battery stacks and turbines may become, uh, may become practical for long duration storage where they wouldn't ever be used in a daily cycling system where the power costs really dominate. And the power, the power block itself also has a big impact on the efficiency of the system. And so now we're moving into the operational cost of the system, no longer the, the capital cost we've been talking about before. And so every time we charge and discharge a storage system, some of that energy is dissipated as heat. And there's a value or a cost uh, associated with that heat. And that's what's shown here on the, on the left, uh, on the y-axis. And if we look at electrons coming into our system at say two and a half cents per kilowatt hour, we know we have a system cost target of say five cents per kilowatt hour per cycle. And we look at the difference between those two. We can see that 
for a 33% efficient system, for example, we have no budget left for capital costs. So obviously that's not gonna cut it. So the efficiency is, is an important parameter. And if we think about types of technologies that, uh, and maybe the upper bound of efficiency they can achieve, we see for things like power to gas, where we're generating hydrogen and then running it back through a fuel cell, or for thermal storage uh, processes, the round trip efficiency is really key. So improving that is, is critical to achieving cost effective long duration storage at a fixed cost per cycle. Now I wanna leave you with just sort of a, a general overview of um, the, the design space for long duration storage. And in particular, cost is king for long duration storage, meaning that we can sacrifice performance, things like efficiency to a certain extent, uh, cycle life of the materials, purity, um, in the interest of, of driving towards lower costs. And this is very different than what we've looked at in the conventional design space for daily cycling applications or transportation applications. Uh, so this is the challenge we're putting out there is how can we sort of explore this new parameter space. And with that, I'd, I'd like to say this is currently an area of active program development. Uh, we, of course, would like your feedback and ideas. Uh, we had a workshop on this topic uh, this past December, and you can find more information on the presentations there on our website. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and introduce our next speaker, uh, we Michael Campos. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Campos, and I'm an RPE fellow. I'm here to talk about teaching old oil and gas wells new tricks in energy storage. And as we've seen in this session, uh, we've focused on a couple of different types of grid services, ranging from ancillary services over the short term toward daily and weekly cycling and long duration storage. Now, when I look at this top right corner of the graph here, where we're in high renewables, we need even longer duration storage, and the challenge becomes one of harnessing massive resources. And so I'm broadly interested in technology's ability to unleash resources that have either been long ignored or long uneconomical, and I, I point to a couple modern examples to highlight this. Uber and Lyft took idle cars and idle drivers and turned it into a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, Google and Facebook took mountains of, the mountains of internet uh, data that we, we leave behind as internet users and turned it into mountains of ad revenue. And back in the physical realm, um, hydraulic fracturing has unlocked depleted, or has unlocked uh, shale oil and gas that used to be difficult and expensive to, to go get. But it's made it such a plentiful resource that it's fundamentally shifted the global balance of power to, in the US's favor and defeated peak oil theory. Oops. So the, the Washington Post put out a map of the US um, oil and gas production resources and in this map, the, uh, each green dot represents an oil well, each pink dot represents a natural gas well, and each line connecting them represents a major pipeline. There's no two ways about it. The US is the world's fossil fuel superpower. We produce more oil than Saudi Arabia, more natural gas than Russia, and the impact of this industry is roughly the size of South Korea's entire GDP. Now, I'm here to propose that the man-made remnants of this oil and gas production could themselves become a vast resource. Some back-of-the-envelope calculations suggest that there's roughly 700,000 to 3.5 million inactive wells in the U.S. Um, if we take a couple million cubic meters per well, that gives us a couple trillion cubic meters total storage volume. And making some assumptions about energy density you can store in that volume, we're talking about hundreds to thousands of terawatt hours, which is enough energy to power the entire country for portions of the year. And so we're truly talking about uh, seasonal level storage. Moreover, if we look at where we're going to need storage on a seasonal scale first, um, it kind of lines up pretty well with where the renewable resources are the greatest, uh, wind being mostly in the, the central part of the country and solar being mostly in the southwest. At least these are the, where the best resources are. And so I'm here to ask the question of, can we unleash depleted wells as this massive energy storage resource? We have oil and gas know-how uh, from R&D and infrastructure. We have a portfolio of storage concepts, and what we need are creative adaptations to link the two. Now, if we zoom into the, the level of an individual oil or gas well, what we see are that they're relatively large, reasonably well-sealed containers. Um, decades of oil and gas R&D have given us uh, advanced surveying, sensing, and drilling capabilities, such that we actually have a pretty good idea of what's underground. Now, for, for wells that have already been explored, 
Um, most of the hard work has been done already, and the question to me becomes, can we effectively leverage them for some other purpose? Now, what might that something else be? Um, we've seen a, a range of storage technologies. Uh, I wanna focus on the absolute cheapest ones for reasons that uh, Paul and Joe have outlined very, very well. Um, in particular, pumped hydro, compressed air, and geologic hydrogen. What I see the potential being for depleted wells is to take these already cheap technologies and push them even cheaper while ideally not shedding too much efficiency in the process. So I'll, I'll highlight each of these three briefly and first look at geologic hydrogen. Um, so in hydrogen, the state of the art is dissolving away enough of a salt formation underground such that you, you build a cavern and you can um, compress hydrogen and, and release it reversibly. Some work out of Sandia National Lab suggests that if you were to shift to depleted well storage for hydrogen, you get about a 25% cost, cost advantage up front. <clears throat> you also get a couple years head start because it takes a while to, to mine salt caverns. That being said, hydrogen's, it's not uh, as simple as that. Hydrogen doesn't behave as well underground as natural gas. Um, and a depleted well is not a shiny stainless steel container. There's going to be some, some losses, some impurities. And the question to me becomes, does that work within this 25% you get up front for free? Can you make this work more economically? So compressed air energy storage has uh, very similar trade-offs to hydrogen, but the challenges focus more so on the thermodynamics of compression and expansion. Um, this raises some interesting challenges to me. Uh, if we consider depleted well storage uh, first, can you consider some of the natural gas that you're naturally going to dredge up during compression and expansion in a depleted well? Can you monitor that and use it for reheating um, upon uh, release of the gas because it cools when it expands? Second, uh, when you compress the gas, it releases heat. Can you use some of this or can you store some of this effectively over the long term? And this all comes back to the question of how do you reduce the financial risk of one of these, of one of these plays? There's only one compressed air energy storage plant in the US. A uh, second was planned, but eventually was canceled because of financial risk concerns. If depleted wells uh, as the container can significantly lower this, it could be what puts this technology over the edge. And last, uh, we've, we've seen uh, pumped hydro in previous talks. Uh, as, as Paul and Joe highlighted, it's, uh, it's cheap, it's safe, it's mature, it's, it's a great technology, but um, it's more or less maxed out and new siting and construction uh, concerns are, are difficult. So there, there have been some recent concepts that have taken this upper reservoir and actually flipped it on its head. I wanna just highlight briefly. Um, so one is by taking a piston and putting it underground and pumping water underneath it. You've essentially created a new upper reservoir. Another is by pressurizing water in uh, rock formations that can elastically deform. Um, you can store energy that way. Uh, two companies are exploring these concepts that could make pumped hydro uh, considerably more citable. <clears throat> and so, last, uh, here are the innovations I think, I think are needed to make this, uh, this work. I'm bullish on the idea that some of the million or so uh, inactive wells could work as energy storage media. To get there, I think we need location optimization to understand the uh, subsurface resource availability, the state of repair of the wells underground, that it, it's widely varied and it depends on uh, you know, where you are, how long it's been in use, how much is remaining. <clears throat> we need storage simulations to answer the question of one, how can we minimize the, the, the losses that we're going to experience in these relatively dirty operations? And um, two, is this going to be a deal breaker? Are these losses insurmountable? I don't know the answer to that question and I'd, I'd open it up to those of you who know more about this than me. And of course, you're always going to deal with safety concerns and environmental considerations anytime you're talking about large scale, especially geologic storage, that's, that's paramount. And then last, uh, we need forgiving power conversion devices that can handle uh, mixtures of compounds, often fluctuating mixtures based on how long the operation has, has been going. Um, ideally without sacrificing much efficiency or lifetime. I think, I think any team that is gonna tackle this challenge effectively is going to have to be interdisciplinary. Um, these are pre, three pretty separate challenges, and so I think uh, we'll need new combinations of people to get this done. So thank you for your time. Uh, this is an early stage idea. Uh, if you liked it, come talk to me. If you hated it, come talk to me. 
Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to having conversations with all of you. Um, and next, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Jenny Gerby. Uh, thank you for your time. All right, remember to text those questions. I might regret saying that. No, it's OK. So now for something somewhat different um, and not controversial at all, I'm going to talk about blockchain. So it used to be that, let's say, I have a chicken, and I'd really like to get your leg of lamb. I would have to go physically meet you, inspect your leg of lamb. You'd inspect my chicken. We'd both decide they were good. We would barter, and we would move on. Civilization got to a certain point, and then some very smart people said, well, wait a minute. What if we have something that's rare, that we all trust the quality of, it doesn't degrade over time? We're all going to agree that we can use money and currency in exchange instead of doing barter for goods. So now I can send a ship full of uh, gold somewhere instead of a ship full of chickens. So this is a pretty big sea change in terms of civilization. And so that moved on. And then we had some really exciting things happening, like double entry bookkeeping and laws and contracts, and countries with stable governments that would penalize people for breaking those laws and contracts. So now we can trust those systems. And now civilization moves ahead again. I think this is a sea change in civilization. All of these things depend on trust. You need to trust in the currency. You need to trust in the system. You need to trust in the government. And that's how we work today. So it's interesting to think of you know, the semiconductor revolution, the internet revolution. How does this look now? Do we have other options available to us uh, that don't need these other systems? So if you can imagine some sort of a system that basically uses brute force computation to overcome the need for any of those systems, that's essentially what a blockchain is. Something that's completely distributed, it's that picture on the right, total full consensus, you don't need to trust anybody. You don't even know who they are, but it's not just that, you don't even need to trust in the systems because the blockchain is fundamentally trustable. And so this enables transactions over the internet without the need for all that other stuff I just talked about. You know, you don't really get things for free, most of us. So we're going to talk about what the penalties of doing that are. Very briefly, I just want to make sure I'm being very clear about what I'm defining, and this is why I'm calling it a classic blockchain. I haven't really heard anybody else call it this. This is the thing that's behind Bitcoin. My point here is that it's fully distributed. It's fully decentralized. It's open. Anybody can use it, and everybody is doing the work all the time. And that's a key, OK? So basically, you're taking in the transactions, you're doing a bunch of computation, you're making the next entry in this ledger. It also depends on the past history of this ledger. And then it's random as to who's chosen to actually put their entry into the ledger permanently. You don't know who's going to do it. And that's why people trust it, because it's fully decentralized and you don't know who's going to make that next entry. And everybody can see the entire history of that ledger, and everybody has a copy of that ledger. So there's an enormous amount of work going on here, and that's why people trust it. They call it proof of work. But most of that work is wasted. So think about this. You're talking about a system that gets over the need for having these systems of trust, but you have to pay for it. And how much are you willing to pay for it? That's really the guts of what this talk is. And it's sort of an invisible cost, and this is the tricky part. Um, distributed computation is very hard to measure in terms of how much energy we're using. We know how much energy data centers use in general, but we don't know how much energy distributed computation uses. And this is one of the reasons why I think this got so far before you know, there was really too much consensus about it being you know, uh, not something that is scalable in terms of energy. So think about that invisible cost. So there's different people who will put different numbers around this, OK? Here's one reference, which is the Blockchain uh, Energy Computational Index. I think that's what it's called. The web address is there. But at least they're open about how they do it. And you can go and you can look and see how they're doing this calculation. So if you look at, and this is open too, this is the number of uh, hash rate is essentially the number of hash functions that people are computating uh, on the Bitcoin network. And that has reached about 25 exahashes per second. That was about two weeks ago. 
Now, you can be forgiven for not knowing what that means because exa is not a unit that you often see. It means 10 to the 18, okay? That is a very, very big number. It was a big deal when they reached one exa hash. So a transaction on this network, not mining a Bitcoin, but you know, buying something or exchanging Bitcoin or something like that, the transaction could power 27 houses a day. It's the same amount of carbon in one or two tanks of gas. That is unsustainable. Last year it was more energy than all of Ireland. This year it's more energy than all of Bangladesh. I think we can agree that there's an issue here. So if you're talking about using blockchain for things like energy microtransactions, and there's the potential for something to scale and cost this much energy for a transaction, that doesn't make any sense. So if you think about, let's say, financial transactions and you look at the number of visa transactions there are and how much energy that takes, again, this is the same reference, you can think that there's an energy penalty, just back of the envelope, of 10 to the 6. Fine, you can quibble with this, we can take an exponent off of it. I don't care, that's still almost three times the amount of energy that the entire country uses. So if we had all of our credit card transactions be on a fully open decentralized blockchain, that's how much energy it would use. So my point is it's not just a little bit bad, it's many, many orders of magnitude bad. And that just fundamentally is unsustainable. But a lot of people, when they say blockchain, that's not really what they mean. So you can think about, well, all right, I just showed you this example of a classic blockchain, but what if you close it and you only let certain people in the system or they need permission to get on the system? What if we actually start to centralize it a little bit? I've seen some examples of this that really just look like secure distributed data management, which is totally okay. So sometimes people aren't all talking about the same thing. So when you think about this open classic blockchain and you're in this circle here where we have systems of laws and contracts and stable governments, you really have to think about why you need that, okay? It's a little bit different if you're thinking about, say, you're sending aid to this country and there are people doing this. For example, the Gates Foundation is looking into this because now on the other side of that transaction, you don't have the stable systems of laws and contracts and governments. So if we think about it, again, there's no numbers behind this. This is a cartoon thought experiment. You know, people talk about validated supply chain or interoperability standards. You might not need a blockchain for that. You really have to think about what that cost penalty is, that time penalty is, that energy pen penalty is. Unfortunately, I don't have numbers for you in terms of what these potential applications might look like in terms of what the energy penalty is. I sure wish I had it. The reason why I care is that this is happening now. This is a GTM research report that they just put out and $324 million in blockchain and energy. That's a lot of investment right now. So people are making decisions right now. If you're a senior vice president at a utility or an energy services company and everybody's freaking out at you because you have to do blockchain or there's other people that are doing blockchain and it's something you really, really need and this is all new to everybody, what choice do you make there? I mean, you can hire a really smart team and put together some sort of classic blockchain and you find out five years later that it's fundamentally unsustainable. That's a big risk for you. And you know, one of the issue, reasons why this issue, I think, keeps coming up is, this is Google Trends that I pulled last week. Um, I don't have much time left or I'd ask you to guess, but the red is cloud computing, blue is IoT, yellow is blockchain. This is one of the reasons why this is getting scary, because people have to make decisions on this without any data. We need informed decision making. We need to know how much energy a certain type of blockchain tool is going to cost at scale. We need to understand what scale means for that tool, et cetera. We don't have these numbers. How do you decide what your return on investment is with a tool when you don't know how much energy it uses, especially if you're in an energy uh, application? So we need an energy audit tool for blockchain. So I have one more bonus chicken picture for you. Thank you very much. If you have any questions and concerns, complaints, rants, bring it on. I would love to hear it. I am literally asking you to put blockchain in the title of your email though so I don't miss it. But thanks very much for your attention. Okay, so we now, uh, we have some time for questions um, and I'm gonna you know, ask each of our panelists here at least one, one question. Um, so this first one for Corey, 
So why should we withhold potential production to offer ancillary services when the power generated from renewable resources is free, uh, I guess on a marginal basis, unlike conventional generators? I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, the production of a renewable resource on the margin is free from the perspective of a renewable resource. But the point is that in terms of operating the system, it's not free. It has a cost. It, its cost is, in, is driven based upon the fact that other resources must compensate for that resource's variability and uncertainty. And that's not accounted for today. And as long as we don't account for that, we're going to continue to drive down this path of not adequately utilizing these resources. Conventional resources are mandate, mandated to provide these ancillary services today. They withhold capacity. Uh, you go to the renewable resource, it may be free and on the margin for itself to produce, but again, on a system-wide basis, that is absolutely not the case. And cases like this have already been examined in, in places that have a higher penetration level of renewables, for instance, in Germany. Okay, that's great. Um, so, Paul, a question for you. Um, so does the cost of an energy storage system on an energy basis always decrease with increasing duration? So coming down that cost curve. Um, no. <laughs> and uh, there can be some subtle effects here that you wouldn't necessarily see when you do the daily storage problem. So one example would be in thermal systems where um, as you go toward longer durations, if you want to maintain a certain range of efficiency, the insulation requirement will go up. And so the, the curves that I drew, for example, and I think maybe Joe showed as well, show a, a plateau, but there are definitely examples, and it's kind of a different paradigm as well as you think about going out toward, you know, between 10 and 100 hours, where you gotta really think carefully about how um, things work at, at 50 to 100 hours. And there's, there's, there's several cases where you can think of costs actually going up as the duration goes down. So those would be the kinds of things that people would, would, would want to address and have creative ideas to, to overcome if, uh, if they're interested in, in proposing ideas for this problem statement. Uh, so, Michael, um, what, what kind of cleanup would be needed to adapt old wells to, to energy storage? So, I, I think this is a, a great opportunity for um, oil and gas companies or someone to come in and buy, buy the land to leverage this existing infrastructure for a new purpose. Um, that being said, it's not, there's a bunch of adaptation work that has to take place. Um, a lot of that, I think, is going to come in terms of surveying, I, I think it's not obvious what the state of repair might be of an existing well. Um, and that would inform what, you know, where, where you're looking for this type of resource. Um, unfortunately, uh, from an outsider's perspective, it's a little bit difficult to figure out on the individual well level, you know, where are the best ones. A lot of this data is proprietary, and it's managed state by state. Um, and so it's, it's just, it, it is an information gathering challenge. Um, now, once you're actually, once you've actually decided on an operation, um, you'd want to maximize the compatibility of whatever working fluid you're, you've decided on with the underground container. Um, for example, you might worry that uh, hydrogen could embrittle the rock formations, or you might worry that uh, water and oil mixtures could screw up a turbine back at the surface. And so th these are the kinds of considerations that I think are important in this, in this challenge. All right, thanks. So I, uh, I'll take a question. Um, so this, this came from uh, several different people. So what about one-way energy storage in the sense of making hydrogen or hydrogen carriers that is used for making ammonia or hydrocacking or transportation? Um, I think that's a great question, and we are certainly interested in more than just you know, electrons in, electrons out, which is what Paul and I were talking about for long-duration storage. Um, we've got a program on that, actually refuel, looking at, at doing just that uh, with renewable electricity. Of course, Germany's got a lot of efforts in um, electrolysis and you know, doing things like injecting hydrogen into the natural gas grid at low percentage. Um, those, are, those are all uh, important options. Uh, one issue with that is that it doesn't provide grid resiliency in the same way that electrons in, electrons out can provide. Um, so if you have a power outage and there's no way to get your hydrogen back to electricity, then, you know, of course, that's, uh, that's an issue. So I think both types of solutions are going to be needed in the long term um, with power to gas, with sort of geologic type storage being one option for electricity in, electricity out. Of course, there are maybe some arbitrage opportunities is, you know, do we, do we send that hydrogen into a future hydrogen infrastructure or do we 
turn it back into electrons. So that's, uh, I think it's still an open question and, and we're pursuing both uh, at RBE. So um, Jenny, kind of an obvious question I think, um, what would a program in blockchain look like at RBE? It's a very good question. Um, it would not look like putting something on that graph I showed with all of those different options. I think that the market is coming up with a lot of options just fine. Um, what I would see RPE doing is actually having a program that would develop that tool and validate that tool so that people could use it to test the scale of the system that they're putting together and test how much energy it's going to be used, that, that it would use, right? So it's really just uh, a measurement that would be available to people so that they can make an informed choice about what they want for their application. Um, so, Paul, uh, how does the response time of energy storage impact, you know, short-term versus long-term storage? Yeah, right. So, one of the classic applications for energy storage um, today is, in, in, especially the batteries that are being put in systems today, is frequency regulation. So, there's a lot of um, lithium-ion storage used for frequency regulation in, uh, in PGM, for example. And so there, the response time is very short, in the order of tens of milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds, something like that. Um, and that's certainly a very valuable um, application for, for an energy storage system. As you think about going toward longer durations, uh, the problem statement does shift a bit. Um, in particular, if you're using hours, you know, 50 to 75, you probably know well in advance, you know, at least tens of hours in advance that you might need to use those. And so the response time becomes a very different kind of requirement and you think about response time very differently um, as you move toward longer duration systems which almost certainly are gonna be involved in essentially energy time shift as opposed to other kinds of services energy storage can provide such as ancillary services and, and, and things like that. So we have time for one more quick question only because I, I really wanna ask it. Uh, so Jenny, if I have a Bitcoin, what should I do? <laughs> if you have a Bitcoin, oh. what should you do? All right, who asked that? Um, a, pay your taxes, and B, just be mindful of the amount of energy those transactions are taking. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone for their attention and time this morning, and thank you very much.